Einen schönen guten Tag, liebe Kolleginnen, liebe Kollegen. Wir hoffen, Sie haben sich nach dem gestrigen arbeitsintensiven ersten Tag unseres Workshops ein bisschen erholen können. Und wir freuen uns sehr, heute Herrn Professor Dieter Gosewinkel begrüßen zu dürfen, der heute die zweite Keynote vortragen wird. Nachdem Sie unsere ausführlich gestalteten Unterlagen bereits haben, werde ich mich ganz kurz fassen, was seine Person und seine überlange Publikationsliste anbelangt. Sie wissen also aus unseren Unterlagen, dass er als Historiker und äh, als Co-Direktor des, äh, oh, hier steht es auf Englisch, Center for Global Constitutionalism des Wisch Wissenschaftszentrums Berlin für Sozialforschung tätig ist und an der Freien Universität äh, arbeitet. Ähm, nun, wir haben das Privileg, äh, von ihm heute bekommen zu haben, erst vor einigen wenigen Tagen, wie mir gesagt wurde, sein neuestes Werk äh, ansehen zu dürfen, nämlich Schutz und Freiheit, Fragezeichen, Staatsbürgerschaft in Europa im 20. und 21. Jahrhundert. Ähm, ich weise bescheidenerweise darauf hin, dass es das ein Geschenk für das Wiesenthal-Institut ist, sodass Sie gerne eingeladen sind, es sich kurz anzusehen, aber das ist es auch schon. So, ähm, verzeihen Sie bitte, dass wir ein bisschen später als Contempore angefangen haben, aber einige von Ihnen haben sich äh, einige, äh, ein bisschen Sauerstoff in dem wunderbaren Garten schon haben getankt. Und ähm, laut Programm äh, wissen Sie, dass wir eigentlich äh, nicht ursprünglich vorgesehen haben, äh, eine äh, Diskussion, aber wir werden sehen, wie sich ähm, jetzt, wie, sie, wie es sich zeitlich entwickelt. Ähm, offiziell sollten wir um 10.30 Uhr, können wir mit der Kaffeepause beginnen, aber vielleicht gehen sich, sofern Herr Professor Gosewinkel dazu bereit sein wird, vielleicht gehen sich einige Fragen aus, sonst haben wir das äh, Glück und Privileg, äh, dass Herr Professor Gosewinkel äh, noch länger äh, hier bis, bleibt. Ja, bis zum Ende. Wunderbar. Mhm. Ähm, das heißt, wir haben dann die Möglichkeit, ähm, äh, den Vortragenden auch ähm, später zu befragen, sprich also im Rahmen der Diskussion ab 12.15 Uhr. Jetzt aber ähm, freuen wir uns, Herr Professor Bosewinkel, ich darf Sie bitten. Herzlichen Dank. Ähm, ich möchte dem äh, Wiesenthal Institut herzlich danken für diese Einladung, ähm, Frau äh, Kovac, Herrn Raski und auch äh, Frau Starek, herzlichen Dank für die Einführung. Ähm, das Thema, über das ich spreche, ist mein äh, sozusagen äh, ja, äh, Lebensthema geworden, ähm, seitdem ich vor ungefähr 23 Jahren äh, mich das erste Mal entschieden habe, darüber wissenschaftlich zu arbeiten und das Buch, das Sie hier sehen, ist der Versuch, daraus eine Summe zu ziehen. Ähm, Sie mögen selbst beurteilen, was das für eine Summe ist. Und I'm now going to talk in English, uh, because I was asked to uh, speak English. Is that okay? Well, I'm going to talk about citizenship as the dominant political form of political belonging in 20th and I would say also 21st century uh, European history. Uh, citizenship as the dominant form of political belonging. And I'm going to argue in a more, let's say, abstract way. Um, I'm something in between. I'm, by training, I'm a lawyer and historian, both. And I'm working with social uh, scientists. So it's a mixture of these disciplines. And some will find history, others are interested in law, and uh, some uh, will find some more theoretical question uh, uh, borrowed from, uh, from social science. So, we are talk if we talk about citizenship, we are talking about membership. And membership is a fact of everyday life. 
Every human has a sense of belonging to many contexts, to a family, uh, a club, a party, a religious community, or to a city, a nation, to a state, and ultimately to humanity. These and many other affiliations are freely chosen and can be changed at will. But what happens if the desired membership is denied or an unwanted membership imposed? What does it mean if this denial or ascription of membership determines the life opportunities or very survival, survival of those affected? Please uh, let us consider two fictional randomly chosen examples which tell stories, stories that could have happened at any time and uh, the material of, uh, let's say, the imagination of these stories is taken from the archives which I have consulted as an historian. So the first story is a story of a Prague family in March 1939, family uh, in Prague former citizens of the Czechoslovak Republic of Jewish origin, but secular in attitude, they fled the German protectorate to France, seeking refuge in the Third Republic. The authorities took their time processing their application for naturalization. Although the family had the support of the mayor of the municipality where they had found a home and were well-liked, the Vichy Ministry of Justice rejected the application in September 1940, for, as you know, the political system had meanwhile changed from a republic to an authoritarian collaborationist regime. This new authoritarian government, which collaborated with the German occupation regime, not only forbade the nationalization of aliens of Jewish origin, but also began to deprive naturalized Jewish families of their French nationality and to hand foreign Jews over to the German authorities. The Prague family and the stories have been taken from the life story of Saul Friedländer, whom I had the honor, the honor to, uh, to see in Geneva when I was studying there. The Prague family, destitute, not entitled to social assistance, try to escape this fate by fleeing via a port in the south of France. They were stopped at passport control as stateless persons, handed over to the National Socialist regime via a transit camp for Jewish aliens, and deported to a concentration camp in Eastern Europe. Second example and second story. In 1951, a young Spanish woman decided to flee the Franco dictatorship, under which, as a woman and socialist, she could not engage freely in political activities. Atheist by conviction, and with close ties to the underground Spanish Communist Party, she managed through contacts at the Soviet mission in Madrid to obtain an entry permit for the Soviet Union. There, she soon found a permanent job in an enterprise and married a Russian, but kept her Spanish nationality and contact with her country of origin. When in the late 1970s, political differences of opinion with the manager of her firm resulted in her exclusion from the Works Council, she decided to leave the Soviet Union and was granted an exit visa. She returned to her home country, Spain, where a new republican system had been put in place after the death of Franco. She entered politics, was elected to parliament on the Socialist Party ticket, where she contributed to the legislation on the separation of church and state. After the demise of the Soviet Union, she found her way back to Moscow as envoy of the Spanish government. Now, this is some, let's say, fictional, but to some extent representative material, uh, which is the background for the more abstract and theoretical questions I'm going to, uh, to deal with now. And I'm going to start with some 
general remarks on questions and concepts, and then go into detail um, by trying to show um, how citizenship became the dominant form of political belonging throughout 20th century by looking at other, let's say, forms of membership and belonging which became less important compared to citizenship. But now, first remarks on concepts and questions. These two scenarios which I've drawn are concerned with the forms and effects of membership in situations where individuals rebel, oppose against ascribed, ascribed membership or its limits and make their own choices with success or tragic failure. The ascribed memberships at issue decide people's opportunities in life, at times even their chances of survival. This involves a special kind of membership, membership of a group which beyond the private sphere has consequences in the political sphere, which thus define political membership. It inv political membership involves membership of a state, a nation state. What is at stake is the protection and social existence that this membership provides and the risks that arise if this membership fails or a change is attempted. Common to the two cases is that the political membership to be renounced or retained is membership of a state. The people involved in our two examples aspire to citizenship and demand the concomitant rights. They want both protection for their elementary physical and social existence and to exercise their political freedom and engage in participation as members of a political community. The protection of their existence and life opportunities depends ultimately on their status as citizens, on the elementary status of political membership. This brings us to my key thesis. My key thesis is that in the European history of the 20th century, the hallmark of political membership is citizenship. This means that among the many degrees of political membership, citizenship is historically the key legal and sociological category for establishing and distributing individual life opportunities. And second, the outstanding importance of citizenship also distinguishes the 20th century significantly from earlier periods of history with other forms of political membership. And these other forms of political membership I'm going to discuss afterwards. Uh, just um, for conceptual reasons, for reasons of definition, two comments are needed on terminology. The German term, if you use the German term, Staatsbürgerschaft, Staatsbürgerschaft, translated here as citizenship, the German term Staatsbürgerschaft, citizenship, covers two aspects, two aspects. First, the legally defined formal membership of a nation state. In German, this so-called external aspect of citizenship is termed Staatsangehörigkeit, Staatsangehörigkeit, which we can translate literally as membership of the state, uh, in the sense of the English word nationality, of the English legal word nationality. So Staatsangehörigkeit is the English legal term nationality. Uh, in French it's nationalité. Uh, uh, so we have this equivalence between Staatsangehörigkeit, nationality in a legal sense, nationalité in the legal sense. But if I'm talking about citizenship, I don't only cover this first legal meaning of membership of the state, but the second meaning. And this second meaning uh, refers to the rights and duties that arise from this formal status, the inner aspect of citizenship. Historically, nationality, Staatsangehörigkeit, has developed as a necessary condition for gaining citizenship rights. 
Membership of a nation state and membership of a group of right holders would thus go together. But this link between the two aspects of citizenship is, as you know, historically contingent, not systematically necessary. Fundamental rights to which only nationals were initially entitled can at a later historical stage be granted to non-nationals, that means inhabitants of a state's territory. The development of citizenship in the 20th century bears witness to this change over time in membership relations. So, this was about definition and terminology. The historically determinative role of the state in defining central political membership is hence understood as a product of the times and subject to change. The question is thus not only whether and why the state was able to become the focus of political membership uh, in the 20th century, but also whether at the turn of the century, from 20th to 21st century, this connection began to loosen, this connection between nationality and citizenship rights and rights. Nevertheless, a point of departure can be identified for a strand that can be followed through the entire history of the idea of citizenship, citoyenneté, Staatsbürgerschaft, from its beginnings in antiquity, if you want. The first point is the function and capability of defining the exclusion of non-members. Citizenship means to define members and to exclude non-members, thus implicitly defining membership. It is this binary structure and the elementary distribution effect based on it that explain the fierce and often violent battles fought over the definition of citizenship. And the second, let's say, essential feature and, uh, is something nearly trivial. As you know, citizenship is constituted by law. It is a legal status. In the five sections which follow, now in the main part of my talk, I'm going to discuss alternative forms of political membership. Um, uh, and I want to argue that these alternative forms of political membership became less and less important while citizenship was rising to the dominant form of political membership in 20th century European history. The first, the first uh, uh, pol form of political uh, membership I want to discuss is membership defined by religion. Religion. Does concentrating on membership criteria defined in terms of the state and the law does it not neglect the importance of religion? As you know, recent studies in the history of religion and religious uh, relations contradict the thesis of progressive secularization of Europe from the 19th to the 20th century. If you remember in our example, in both examples, exclusion of the refugee family from Prague from the political community of citizens was grounded in ostensible membership of a religion, the Jewish faith. Although they were not practicing, they were looked at as being Jewish. Throughout the 20th century, moreover, profession of religion shaped the membership of cultures reaching deeply into everyday practices. That we know. However, as far as determining political membership, a different development is in evidence. In the course of the 20th century, religious membership has often determined membership of political parties, for example, and their programmatic orientation. However, this connection between religious and party affiliation has increasingly weakened since the interwar years and still more so since the Second World War. On the whole, by the end of the 20th century in Europe, religion no longer had the force to shape and to differentiate political parties. 
This is equally true for the determination of political membership in the institutions of the state, not only political parties, but institutions of the state. The liberalization and constitutionalization of political authority after 1918, 1945, 1989, had at least thoroughly loosened, loosened the ties between state and church. Look at our example from the French, no, the Spanish woman, uh, communist first and then socialist worked uh, in the constitutional project for the separation between state and church. So this, these ties between church and state loosened and to some extent were even reversed into opposition. As a result of this development, the political membership connection between religion and citizenship was increasingly de uh, delegitimized and to a large extent curbed. The liberal constitutional legal orders of the 20th century often explicitly forbade the selection and classification of citizens in terms of religion. For example, well, we know in practice, political practice, it's clear uh, that this by no means prevented, for example, preferential treatment for certain religious groups in appointments to positions of authority in a state. And particularly under European dictatorships of the 20th century, profession, profession of religion could provide grounds for privileging or excluding people's, people as citizens. This is illustrated by the example of the Spanish woman in her home country, um, as opposed to the Soviet Union. In Spain, in, under Franco, uh, confession of religion played an incredible role uh, for becoming, let's say, a civil servant uh, uh, in, the, in the higher administration. Um, and the case of the Prague refugee family, uh, uh, well, shows how religion could be used as a tool for ascribing ethnic racial membership. That means in all the authoritarian states of 20th century Europe, um, religious affiliation and, on the other hand, anti-Semitism, for example, uh, which is the reverse uh, factor of uh, religious affiliation, anti-Semitism played a major role in excluding people from membership of the political community under the pretext of religious origin. Overall, However, this is, well, this is authoritarian states, dictatorships in European 20th century history. But overall, it can be said that even in the second half of the 19th century, conflicting political loyalties, for example, membership of universal Roman Catholic Church and of a nation state, were capable of provoking serious political disputes about the primacy of membership. This was 19th century. The conflict was diffused in the late 20th century, at the latest, with the political turn of 1989. The democratic constitutions of Europe guarantee religious freedom as a civil right. However, in the conflict of loyalties, the duty of the citizen to comply with the constitution takes precedence over the principle of religious freedom. Well, this was about religion as a competing form of uh, political membership. Uh, I'm now going to, uh, uh, to, uh, to look at political parties, uh, which I mentioned already. Political parties. Party affiliation as a specific form of, of political belonging, political membership. The importance of religion for party ties may have declined in the 19th century, but the political party on the whole developed into a key rallying point for political membership. Parties elaborated political platforms and aggregated interests in consolidating organizations which constituted often closed politico-ideological milieus. They shaped and realized ideas of political membership with lasting effect. But how did citizenship, membership of the state, relate to party membership? I think here we see a change. Whereas in the 19th century, parties often formed that rejected or opposed the existing state against the state, a counter trend emerged from the turn of the 20th century. And by this counter trend, I mean the nationalization and the statization uh, of the party system in the framework of the given nation state. Uh, leaving aside 
labor movements, which were often in fundamental opposition to their state, political parties in general of other provenance began to orient themselves increasingly on their own nation state, to shape the institutions of the state, to exercise influence in and through them became the prime objective of the political party organization. Moreover, the progressive extension of the franchise and the increasing opportunities for parties to play a part in political will formation and the exercise of power enhanced closeness and loyalty to the state. Furthermore, parties focused increasingly on the interests of the voters who wanted to see their parties in positions of power in the state. This statization, uh, uh, I would say, this, this is a process which I would call statization. This statization of uh, a party interests also intensified the distinctive nation state quality. For in all the democratic constitutional orders of Europe after 1945, the right to vote and stand for election, the core political rights of citizenship were tied to membership of the state. And uh, this is the closest connection between the status, the legal status of citizenship, of citizenship rights and nationality, political rights. And uh, this became evident uh, uh, in the middle of uh, the 20th century up to now. This meant that both the voters and the candidates put forward by parties uh, uh, candidates which were put forward by parties approached political will formation on the basis of and in the interest of their membership of the nation state. With the growing dissolution of narrow socio-moral party milieus in Germany and other European party states after 45, the cohesive form of parties decreased. The decline in religious ties and the shift towards large, ideologically and socially plural catch-all parties diminished the relevance of party membership in relation to the state and the citizens' ties of loyalty to the state. I'm now, thirdly, looking at the nation um, as a point of reference for political membership, nation and political membership. In the course of the European 19th century, an awareness of belonging to a nation developed into a determining category of political membership. National movements made a major uh, contribution to the creation of new states. Existing states underwent a process of nationalization. That means the transformation of state institutions in accordance with national objectives. Policy on nationality, for example, in the newly founded German Empire in the late 19th century was gradually adapted to national patterns of thought and notions of membership in which, for example, Poles and immigrating Jews had no place on principle. In a Europe-wide process, the nation-state developed on the definitional basis of membership of the state, a model which persisted until the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. Although the nation remained an important definience um, of political membership throughout the 20th century, the state, the state gained increasing weight in the composite concept of nation-state. In the composite nation-state, state became increasingly important throughout the 20th century. Membership of a nation was now only one criterion, among others, in determining membership of the state, nationality. In defining uh, nationality policy, Staatsangehörigkeitspolitik, nationality policy, became more and more a tool, not just an end in itself, but a tool of comprehensive population policy. In defining inclusion in the status of citizen, this population policy, mixture for a mixture of reasons, this population policy invoked national and racial categories, 
as well as economic and political considerations. Membership of the nation, which was often based on the criterion of language, began to lose its priority as a political criterion of membership after the First World War. Nation was joined by a contingent sequence of changing criteria of ethnicity, Volkstum and race. In consequence, the close link that had pertained in the 19th century between membership of the nation and of the state began to weaken. This process continued after 1945 and especially after 1989 with the slow opening of citizenship under the influence of growing migration flows in Western and Eastern Europe since the 1950s, the acquisition of citizenship has been determined not only by membership of a nation, but increasingly by other criteria of personal suitability, political loyalty and willingness to integrate, as well as by considerations of economic utility. If we consider Europe as a whole, this is not contradicted by the renaissance of national efforts at exclusion in reconstruction, uh, reconstructing the Eastern European world of states after 1989. Attempts to achieve the homogenization of citizenship have come up against the limits set by superordinate international legal obligations and have proved unable to circumvent the concomitant prohibition of discrimination. I hope this is still true. Fourth, another important form of political membership, class class, social class. The notion of political membership that competed most strongly in the course of the 20th century with citizenship was membership of a social class. Characteristic of the first half of the 20th century is that the, cons that the concept of class advanced from its originally scientific analytical meaning to become a political catchword around which parties formed and which shaped ideologies. What is more, it gained political, institutional, state-building force with the foundation of the Soviet Union. This state-building legitimation of class was accompanied by an antithetical political movement transcending the state, aspiring to the development of international class consciousness. The Socialist International defined the politically relevant membership as that of a working class drawing its strength from transcending the borders of the nation state and the narrow particular interests of the state. This position was often in marked contrast to membership in a nation state system, which it was supposed to overcome by revolution. However, looking at the 20th century as a whole, and particularly the second half, class has lost in importance and in political mobilizing force for the determination of political membership. Um, as far as I can see, there are two main reasons. The first reason, social class struggles in European states, which were not under communist rule, were not fundamentally directed against the state. For here, in Western Europe, the state was not, was not seen only as an agent of bourgeois class rule. The purpose was rather to induce the state to implement and guarantee more equality and social security. The aim was not to revolutionize the state, but to turn, to turn the state into a guarantor of equal and broad civil, political and social rights. The epoch-making theory of citizenship advanced by the English sociologist Thomas Marshall draws its analytical force also from its interpretation of the relative pacification and stabilization of modern class-divided societies as the result of successful struggles to implement citizenship rights. The state's success in guaranteeing citizenship rights lent it legitimacy. Political loyalty could thus be transferred from the class to the state. This process was 
uh, posited in Marshall's theory, which was also which also took positive empirical stock of the development of the welfare state up to the mid 20th century. Not least for this reason, it has faced fundamental criticism. The social harmony line taken by Marshall, mitigating rather than fanning class conflict, runs counter to a revolutionary theory of class struggle. And there are still ongoing theoretical debates on this question. The second reason for the loss in the political importance of class membership over citizenship lies in the stagnating or decreasing attractiveness of communist internationalism during the second half of the 20th century. The statization, Verstaatlichung, of European communism under state socialist systems did, with the persistence of real socialism, strengthen awareness of belonging to a particular state. Regardless of propagandistic professions of faith in communist internationalism, the idea persisted of belonging to a politically and culturally separate state, nurturing cultural reference to a historical notion of the nation. Awareness of belonging to a nation state then also gave, as I, can, as I see it, uh, awareness of belonging uh, to a nation state also gave a decisive boost uh, to aspirations for political independence and to reject the doctrine of communist internationalism under Soviet supremacy in the period preceding 1989. Now, my fifth point, after all these alternative forms of political membership, is citizenship itself and the process of its politicization how it came to be politicized and why this was the most important reasons for its, let's say, coming up as the dominant form of political membership. Finally, the importance of citizenship as the badge of political membership in the 20th century grew out of its politicization, politicization of the institution itself. And this process of politicization reflects the greater strength and radicalness compared to the 18th and 19th centuries, the greater strength and radicalness of struggles for membership fought out in the European societies of the 20th century. The politicization of citizenship occurred on two mutually reinforcing levels in struggles for membership within states and between states. And first, a look at the struggles within states. The internal politicization of citizenship rights developed because these rights were increasingly won in societal struggles and not simply granted. The politicization of citizenship that, was, that set in the 19th century reached a new climax after the First World War with the democratization of state rule. Struggles for, uh, for membership were increasingly fought out not only in the arcane recesses of the state apparatus, but in the public political arena, where swords were crossed on the criteria and extent of inclusion and exclusion. For example, the criteria for naturalization, for the franchise, and for the new social rights became the subject of public debates and parliamentary decisions which more and more citizens were able to influence by exercising their political rights. Citizenship rights were therefore no longer determined and granted top-down, but also one bottom-up. The expansion of participation in the constitution of citizenship rights made the struggle for political membership more attractive and therefore more consequential than in the past. Social demands and rights gained a new special status in the emerging welfare state. It's therefore not by chance that Marshall's influential theory of citizenship regards the struggles for social rights as a key driving force in the development of citizenship. 
According to Marshall, citizenship in the 20th century culminated in the development from civil rights to political and finally social rights. You know that. Social rights realized the principle of equality underlying citizenship particularly effectively. For social equality was understood as the logical conclusion of legal equality. Social equality was looked at as a conclusion of legal equality and no longer as independent of the latter. Something which, which, what we might call Verrechtlichung, juridicalization, something like that. Verrechtlichung uh, sozialer Ansprüche. Among Marshall's lasting achievements is to have explained the attaining of social rights historically as the result of social struggles. The more even distribution of resources imminent in the realization of social right also implies an attack on property and power relations dominated by market power. The protect, protracted and not infrequently violent uh, combat uh, conducted by social movements culminated in the second half of the 20th century in a range of legal positions that covered broad domains of social welfare. They were to become the collectively achieved substratum and hallmark of the welfare state. The social rights now added to the political rights of citizens also strengthened loyalty to the given democratic welfare state. Overall, they strengthened the view of citizenship as the form of political membership that most lastingly determines the concrete political and social life opportunities of the individual. However, this imminent tendency towards extension is not, is not to be equated with universalization. For citizenship status was directed towards the community and bound by it, a status whose contours were characterized by exclusion. This is demonstrated by the criteria of access to citizenship applied by all European states in the course of the 20th century. Gender, political loyalty, ethnicity, etc. Nevertheless, by the end of the 20th century, in comparison to its beginning, the legal safeguarding of citizenship status had been extended and strengthened at all levels of the law in all European countries. Now let's look at the, let's say, external uh, uh, reason uh, for the change of citizenship and for its uh, politicization. That means battles and struggles between states. So apart from these, do you understand me well? Yeah. Okay. Um, apart from these, Interna internal changes provoked by social shifts and group struggles, citizenship changed in response to outside pressure exerted by conflicts between countries. The conflicts fought out between European nation states, as you know, were unprecedentedly radical and violent. There are essentially two sorts of change, uh, two sorts of change in relations between citizenship and territory, and I think someone was talking about these questions yesterday. First, changes in the citizenship of a resident population owing to forcible military occupation and concomitant changes in the political affiliation of the territory. And second, changes in citizenship due to the mass expulsion of the resident population from, the, uh, from a territory. So occupation and expulsion. First, let's look a bit more closely at occupation, at the consequences of forcible occupation for citizenship, and take once again the example of the Prague family. The immediate consequence of an occupation regime establishing itself for the long term was often a radical change in the criteria for inclusion and exclusion for membership and non-membership. In the case of the Jewish family exiled from Czechoslovakia, who had been naturalized in France shortly before uh, the outbreak of the Second World War, the German occupation 
the German occupation from 1940 on radically altered their legal status. In the part of France occupied by German troops, the racial legislation of the Nuremberg laws applied as did the legal tools of Germanization, which had been developed step by step after the destruction of Czechoslovakia and its incorporation into the German Reich. That means segregation of French and foreigners classified as Jews, their concentration in camps and subsequent deportation were the direct result. In the unoccupied part of France, a collaborationist regime headed by French politicians introduced new laws on membership, demonstrating concurrence with the key exclusion criteria of the German occupation power. If you look at the Vichy laws 1940, you can see that they are a copy of the Nuremberg laws. One of the first measures undertaken by the collaborationist regime in July 1940 following the legal model of Nuremberg was to eliminate so-called undesirable elements from citizenship by expelling certain groups and rescinding naturalization. These exclusion measures were for several reasons, directed on racial policy grounds primarily against Jews and on political and ideological grounds against regime opponents, both against Jewish people and regime opponents, uh, opponents especially Republicans. Despite many differences, the parallel measures taken by the National Socialist occupying power and the collaborationist regime in France reveal a key aspect of the National Socialist occupation of Europe. Among the first measures taken was the introduction of new selection rules for citizenship. In the directly occupied areas, legal grades of membership ordered in a strictly hierarchical order um, were established. On the lowest level were people classified as Jews or members of inferior races. Reduced to a minimum, their citizenship status, poles away from full citizenship, did not even guarantee survival. At the apex of the hierarchy were the population groups in the occupied uh, territories which were classified as superior, um, who to some extent and after elaborate approval procedures were rewarded, were rewarded by the granting of German citizenship. That means membership of the German national and racial communities. So, uh, both poles of this hierarchy. Countries that were not occupied because they were allied or collaborated with the National Socialists introduced membership rules that at least corresponded to the measures taken by the hegemonic power or adopted these measures up to and including active cooperation in the race-based policy of eradication and extermination. Both political measures, the selection of the population in the occupied areas and mass expulsion, mass expulsion intensified in a completely new manner the need for new rules on membership and citizenship. The compulsion to classify people, to decide clearly who belonged to which conflict party became an existential necessity, indeed a condition of survival. As in the case of the Jewish family from Prague, statelessness, statelessness meant existential defenselessness. Millions of stateless persons in the interwar years, displaced persons later, after 1945, from the territories and camps of European dictatorships could not clearly be ascribed citizenship, membership of a state. I think you, you will have talked about that yesterday, but as Hannah Arendt, she is the protagonist in the discussion, I think, as Hannah Arendt put it, they were de facto outlawed, uh, de facto vogelfrei. George Mosse, the German Jewish historian, wrote this of his flight from Germany and his exile, and I quote. He said, I was aware that I was a Jewish refugee from Germany. 
My statelessness now defined my place, or rather my displacedness in the world. An Italian fascist once described the stateless as the bastards of humanity. End of quotation. This was the age in which the deprivation of citizenship and exclusion from the community of citizen, citizens was invented and used en masse as a tool in political conflicts about membership. The variously motivated deprivations of citizenship had one thing in common, their intention. The circle of those entitled to the protection of the state was to be narrowed, access to citizenship rights was to be redefined, and the value of the citizenship of the country in question was to be politically and symbolically strengthened by the more radical exclusion of non-members. The misery of mass statelessness and defenselessness of the interwar period and wartime persisted massively during the Cold War in the need for protection and unambiguous membership. While United Nations international agreements laid down the right of the individual to citizenship of a country, the confrontation of political memberships between the ideological blocs in, Germ in Europe and the need for protection by the state remained. So the purpose of defining membership remained. The need for clear ascription to a state and guaranteed protection was intensified by the need to provide legal protection for ethnic groups wanting to migrate, for example, to their co-national country. Protection for political dissidents from oppression had obliged to seek refuge in another political system. And finally, protection for labor migrants who did not wish to give up their country of origin or settle permanently in the host country. So the problem of defining membership for several political, economic, and other reasons pertained, persisted. In addition to protection against hard exclusion, citizenship also offered the soft, inclusive, advantage of extended participation in the democratic welfare states of the flourishing industrial societies in, Eastern, in Western Europe. The spread of political rights, in particular civil equality for women, which was certainly not perfect, but increasingly became better and better, as well as the extension of social rights to greater areas and groups, enhanced the status of citizenship both materially and then symbolically. For the broad majority in many European countries, citizenship became the hallmark of material security and political freedom. But this was Western Europe. Now, I'm going to finish with a small part, with a concluding part, but looking also at the future of citizenship and by asking the question, is there an erosion of the concept of political membership? Is there an erosion of the function and uh, relevance of citizenship up to now? In 1989, on the threshold of the 21st century after the short 20th century, citizenship as a principle of political membership celebrated a triumph. With the downfall of the Soviet power bloc, class, had forfeited its predominance as a competing structural uh, principle of uh, membership in the eastern half of Europe. The constitutions of the new democracies centered on the right of the individual to protection of a private sphere against state authority, to political participation in the community, and to social security and support. These key categories of Marshall's development model had been incorporated into the constitutional orders of the former dictatorships of Eastern and Southern Europe in the constitutional orders. The Spanish woman in our introductory case would thus no longer face the choice between a clerical and an atheist dictatorship, but at least in principle, was able to rely on her freedom of religion being respected in all member countries of the Council of Europe. 
in theory, in law. The idea and legal practice of citizenship thus attained the greatest geographical extent and constitutional protection after 1989. There is nevertheless good cause to warn of the decline, the erosion of citizenship and its binding force as a principle of political membership. And these are my last remarks on the, let's say, future of citizenship. The decisive impulse has been given, as we know, by transnationalization. That means the transcending of national borders in establishing and granting rights. The transnationalization of social rights brings a fundamental change, which encroaches on the central function of national citizenship as a tool of social closure. Unlike at the beginning of the 20th century, at its, uh, at its end, social rights were increasingly granted by institutions beyond the nation state or independently of, nation, of national membership. That's just an example, but these and other processes of transnationalization, uh, transnationalization pointing in the same direction have been theoretically underpinned and legitimated in the name of human rights norms. Universalistic theoretical approaches attack the functions of closure, especially where, where justified by national arguments. So there is a fight between universalist and let's say more community organized theories. Um, these let's say more universalistic human rights oriented theories are guided by notions of overcoming national limitations in the image of an avant-garde of uh, cosmopolitans, establishing global links in the metropolises of the world and develop, uh, developing membership of a global city, for example. Independent of place, rather than of a territorially and nationally limited state, global cities, cosmopolitan thinking and acting. However, Contrary to the self-appraisal of these current approaches, we can also see them as a return to obsolete principles of membership, to membership of a city and membership of a class, that is, to a transnational, economically active class of global functional elites. Is this, does this mean that transnationalization hide the return of former forms of political belonging more particular than ever? Well, but how profoundly did these phenomena of transnationalization and globalization affect the main function of citizenship in the 20th century? That means the establishment and definition of political membership. The idea that an ongoing and irreversible uh, process of transnationalization is making citizenship obsolete as an institution of the nation state is based on a conceptual simplifica simplification, I would say. This simplification consists in the blanket delegitimation de de of the nation state as a whole. However, the compound concept nation state, nation hyphen state, nation state, uh, comprising the two elements, nation and state, is now a contingent phenomenon. The loss in importance of the national sphere in the course of transnationalization is thus also seen as farewelling the state, which historically has been associated with the nation only in certain phases, namely in the process of nationalization. It's a contingent composition between the two. What can be said, what can be said today is that ethno-national -nation homogeneity, ethno-national homogeneity, as an excluding definience of the nation in Europe, has been lastingly delegitimated. And this is uh, said by any constitution in Europe and by the law of, uh, uh, international law of the Council of Europe. As we all know, practice, political practice differs, but now I'm looking at the normative level. The ethno-national homogeneity as an excluding definience is delegitimated. A systematic 
racist policy of exclusion and even extermination, as in the case of the uh, Prague uh, refugee family, would be severely sanctioned as a violation of the elementary political values and foundations of Europe. But since its emergence, ethnic nationalization has never been a necessary but only a contingent phenomenon in European statehood in a particular phase of development. This means that at the end of a narrowly defined nation that that the end of a narrowly defined nationality has not put an end to the state as the point of reference for political membership. The state continues to mediate and codify individual rights to guarantee the elementary opportunities to enjoy civil liberties and to engage in political participation. The granting of these rights will in the future remain fundamental to the establishment of political membership. But membership must always be grounded in the distinction between membership and non-membership. Now, going back to the elementary definition of citizenship, defining membership and non-membership. The one is not to be had without the other. Citizenship bringing us back to our point of departure makes this distinction. And in the countries of today's Europe, it does so by the means of democracy. If we thus do not renounce exclusion, the establishment of non-membership, and how could we? If we do not renounce exclusion, citizenship remains indispensable for determining political membership. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much uh, for presenting some important theses and offering a wide range of thoughts which uh, might be incentive for further discussion. I need now your help for the decision whether we should um, have now uh, the coffee, uh, coffee break uh, and start 10 past 11 instead of 11 o'clock or is there anybody who wishes um, immediately um, to uh, ask uh, some important questions? Uh, would you agree that maybe the discussion and uh, asking questions... I like the discussion, yes, you can start with your phone. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if you don't mind, we'll have now the coffee break, um, if I'm allowed to say so, and we'll start at uh, 10 past 11, enough time for a coffee or tea, and then uh, Mrs. Victoria Harms uh, will be the moderator, and uh, I thank you very much for your attention, and once again, uh, thank you very much for the um, important contribution. Thank you.